Okay. All right. Um, we are recording now. Great. So for those of you um, just joining in, um, welcome to our second session of uh, our linear mixed models lectures. And um, as I just said informally, um, I, I am aware that last week uh, was a lot of information very quickly. So instead of introducing a lot more things this week, I'd rather want to go back and talk about some of the things that are really important for you as you do your first uh, linear mixed model, as you do your first analysis. And I'm still going to use um, my eye movement data as an example. So you can really, uh, so you can really take the first video and this video together. You could even decide which one you want to watch first. Um, well, you are you are watching live now, of course. But those of you who are um, who are watching this as a recording, you can decide if this one you want to watch this one first, or and then the first week, or the first week first, and then this one. Um, I hope either way should uh, should work for you, or you can jump back and forth, um, and so on. Okay, so today's um, objective. So we would want we want to revisit how to fit uh, a linear mixed model. We want to use custom contrasts, and we want to talk about how to um, add random slopes and determine the random effect structure for your model. And uh, the fourth point, actually, uh, as I was just revising the slides, I forgot to take this out. Um, maybe, maybe we will do something on this uh, at a later point. I will put some material on this online. But I think for today, it is more important to leave time for questions, which is the last point, than introduce more complexity and more complicated things. So right now, I think, I think, well. Probably what most of you would uh, would benefit the most from is just uh, seeing how do I fit a linear mixed model? Um, what can I do um, to make sure that I have the comparisons that I want to have? And what do I have to do to make sure that the model, uh, the model's effect structure is actually appropriate to the data? So we will do that. Okay, so um, just to catch back up from uh, last week, um, remember the concept of random effect. So instead of assuming that there are fixed group levels with one true population uh, mean value for each group level, um, so, so again, by group levels, I mean factors here too. So, um, so, for example, you have an experiment with three conditions, then um, there is probably one true population mean value for each of the conditions, right? So for my preview conditions, uh, you could say if I keep running the experiment with, uh, with an infinite number of participants, then um, I will get closer and closer to the true mean value for that group level. Well, for that for that condition, right? Um, and those five conditions that I have, I'll, I'll remind you of what they were um, in a second. Um, they cover everything, all the possible levels of that factor, all, all the possible categories of that variable that I might be interested in, right? In this in this experiment, that's a fixed effect. When I uh, have a random effect, instead I'm saying I um, the I still have a categorical variable. So participant, for example, still is a categorical variable, but I am um, but instead of determining the levels of that variable um, by saying this is level one, this is level two, this is level three, and I'm interested in the differences between each of those levels. Right, which I am for my preview manipulation. Right. Um, instead of doing that, I um, I assume that the levels themselves are samples from a larger population. Okay. So that um, 
so that if I rerun the experiment, I might get different levels. I mean, I might get instead of participants one, two, three, I might get participants uh, let's say 51, 52, 53 out of out of all the possible participants. And that's completely fine because I'm not going to determine, uh, I'm not going to say I care about the particular participant who's in the experiment. I care about all the variance that is explained by having uh, different participants in the experiment. And the same thing with experimental materials. So words, sentences, paragraphs, pictures, um, all, those, uh, all those stimuli where, um, where, sure, we choose the stimuli, but we don't choose the stimuli um, as, because we care particularly about this one stimulus, we choose the stimuli as representatives or as samples from a much larger population of all possible experimental stimuli, right? And uh, this is very important for us as language researchers, right? Because um, clearly we cannot sample, uh, we, cannot have, we cannot have the entire language in our experiment. So every time we pick experimental items, um, we are essentially trying to get a sample of all the possible uh, items that we could use, right? And um, again, if we repeat the experiment, we could, we could repeat the exact experiment with um, different subjects and different sentences and, uh, and hopefully get the same conclusions, right? So we don't care about what the particular subjects are and what the particular items are. We care about um, we care about what the different levels of the fixed effect are, right? Okay, and again, uh, ran adding random effects to a model. If you just have a single random effect, then you can use a repeated measure SANOVA, but um, as language researchers, we are usually not that lucky, right? Um, so for more than one random effect, uh, like subject and item, uh, we use linear mixed models. Okay, so just a reminder of uh, the example data set. Um, so again, we're looking at experiment two from Angela et al. Uh, 2013, which was a gaze contingent display change study um, with a preview that could be um, a repetition of the preboundary word. It could be orthographically related to the preboundary word. So where the preboundary word is news here, right? Could be semantically related. It could be a non-word, um, or it could be the actual word that uh, that followed after the boundary. And after participants crossed the boundary, um, all these previews were replaced with the word that actually belonged at this point in the sentence, which is the word once. Okay, so. We have, um, so we have these five conditions that we're interested in. And um, today, instead of single fixation duration, we're going to look at gaze duration. And that was, if you, if you read the paper, which uh, is, a, is included in the materials for the first week, um, that is uh, the most important measure that we report uh, there as well. So gaze duration is the sum of all first pass fixations on a word. Um, so all first fixations and all refixations. So uh, if you move your eyes uh, within the same word without leaving the word, it's called a refixation. Uh, that were made during the first time a reader looked at the word. So that's what first pass is. So the first time you look at the word, before you leave the word, um, all the fixations you make on the word are included in gaze duration. If you leave the word and then go back later, that is no longer included, okay? So um, in general, it's a, it's a slightly noisier measure than uh, single fixation duration because you have the possibility of having multiple fixations, but it, uh, in general, it's a, it's a good estimate of, um, what was, of what the time was that you needed essentially to, um, to process the, 
the, this word to the point where you, well, where you or your, your processing system felt comfortable to leave it and to read on uh, towards the next word. Okay, so let's fit a linear mixed model again uh, with preview condition as a fixed effect. So it's a categorical variable, right? It has these five levels, identical repetition, orthographically related, semantically related, and non-words, so five levels. Um, we need to load our packages again. So uh, just remember that you can install any packages that you don't have uh, by using install.packages. And for example, if you needed LME4, you could put LME4 in the quotation marks here. If you need another, um, another package, uh, you can just write it uh, in these uh, quotation marks, inside the quotation marks, and then I will automatically download and install the package for you. Okay, so here um, we'll again be using these three packages, LME4, Elmer test, and tidyverse. Um, so if we, um, so we will need another package a little bit later on, but I will tell you about that um, when the time comes, and then you can, uh, then you can download it. Or then you can then you can uh, load it. Okay, so now um, loading our data. So we want to get uh, we want to get our data um, loaded now. So um, the file is if you don't just downloaded the files uh, is provided for you in the folder um, part five b uh, in uh, on the course website, so you can put them into a new empty folder on a, on the com on your computer. Um, it's a good idea to not mix them with last week's files because uh, you might get confused. Um, always best to keep things uh, apart like that, and uh, we should make sure that all categorical variables that we will use are uh, properly set as factors and we know the level order um, for the preview factor because that's the one that uh, we really care about. So, so to start with, so we've got, um, we've got, we're using read underscore CSV, that's from uh, the, that's from part of the tidyverse. Um, the thing that read underscore CSV does um, better than, um, than the standard read dot CSV is that it gives you uh, the column specification. So basically here, it tells you everything. Everything was, uh, the format for everything was double, which is essentially uh, numeric, right? And then we just have two columns, uh, which are character. And out of those, preview is the one that uh, that we care about. So, um, so as it imports, it already tells you about uh, the column specification. The original read.csv function also turns um, turns variables into factors um, automatically, and that is not a great idea. Well, it works, but you get used to it very too quickly and then you might get confused when uh, it actually does something with the factors that you uh, don't anticipate. So to me um, it's better to just use read underscore CSV. Uh, in order to use that you need to have tidyverse loaded um, and then only make those columns into factors that you want to have as factors. Okay, so uh, here we only need three factors in this case for this particular design, right? We need um, the column subject as a factor, we need the column item as a factor, and we need preview as a factor, right? So, um, so I'm making them into factors by, by just overwriting them with uh, factor version 
of themselves, right? So factor, the factor command makes this column into a factor, into a categorical variable, and then I'll just so I'll just overwrite e dollar sign subject, which is the column subject in the data frame e, with uh, the factor version of this, and I do the same with item. And then for preview, because that's my uh, fixed effect, that's where I actually care about the order of the um, of my levels. I use this levels parameter here. So factor e dollar sign preview, and then I say comma levels equals, and then c. So I I make a list of uh, of all the names. So that way I make sure that the levels in this factor are assigned in the same order as they are um, in my table here. Okay, so that makes, so doing that, I make sure that I always know which order my factor levels have, right? So, so um, and in order to do that, you just uh, need to write the possible level. So you know in the data file, uh, the levels are indicated as correct, repeated, orthographic, semantic, and unrelated. Okay, so um, so doing that, um, you just write you write all the levels in the order that um, that you want to have them, and this will be important later on. So it's it's a good idea to do this. Okay, so now uh, let's do a quick, um, just a quick overview of uh, the descriptives or descriptive statistics. Okay, and we're going to do that using dplyr, so um, which you which you remember from the previous um, from the previous lectures, right? So so I take the data frame, I group it by preview, and then I summarize. Um, Calculating the mean, I take out the um, the NAs, uh, calculate the standard deviation, and again I take out the um, NAs. Then I calculate. Then I use this N, which is very useful inside of functions like summarize to just get the number of entries in each of the groups. Um, and then I calculate the standard error. And, and the neat thing about this is that I can actually I can actually use columns that I've just defined earlier in the in the same summarize command here to calculate uh, my final column. Okay, so standard error, if you remember, is just the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of observations, right? So I can use uh, the column standard deviation that I've created and the column um, number of observations that I've created to um, calculate the standard error of the mean now. And you would need that, for example, if you wanted to then use this to draw a bar plot with error bars, right? And just uh, just a note, so here, we're not saving this anywhere, anywhere. we're just printing it, right? Um, but if you wanted to, you could just uh, use the, uh, the assignment operator in, in R, so the, the little arrow, um, to assign this to a variable, and then, for example, use it to make a bar plot. And then also note that the estimates from the fixed effects that we're going to look at for the model may be slightly different since they don't incorporate the random effects and they don't uh, take into account, for example, that different participants may have a different number of observations. So, so here we just average over all of the participants, all of the items and so on. But what you already see here is, um, you you already see the um, the difference that we're reporting in the paper, right? So we have for the ones that um, where we don't have repeated letters from the currently fixated word to the next word, um, those are about 241, 243, 243, 
but then if we look at the ones uh, that the conditions where we do have repeated letters um, in the paraphobia, so so you have the same letters both where you're looking and to the right of where you're looking, there uh, you are faster. Okay, so so this is just an overview, and that's what you should always do with your data, right? You should always look at the means before you. Um, before you use a model to test your hypothesis, just to see, uh, just to see uh, what are the numerical differences. And if the model gives you uh, a significant difference, so, so for example, if, um, if I now use the model to test the difference between semantic and unrelated, uh, for example, and if I got that significant, then that would be very surprising because that difference doesn't really come out in the means at all. I mean, there, there should be no difference. I mean, sure, this is this is rounded. Um, there there might be some tiny. Uh, no, they're they're val Sorry, I just had the question. Um, are these the values for the word after the boundary? No, they're the values for the word before the boundary. They're the values. They're gaze durations on this word news before the boundary. So the idea is maybe you're going to be faster um, if you, um, while you're looking here, if you have the same word again repeated to the right. And, and remember that the boundary is not visible on the screen. It's just, it's just here so people can see what happens with the display change, right? So, so to the participants, um, it would just be having the same word again to the right of where you're looking at, or a, or a very closely related word. Okay, so if I had a difference between 243 and 243 in the model and I got that significant, then I would be very suspicious of the model because um, the model results would not be reflecting uh, what I see in the means. On the other hand, that difference between um, 241 and 229 um, with a standard error of like about Two point well, two point six between two point six and three point two seven, that may well be significant. So we would want to we well we uh, we would have to look at the model to see if it's significant, right? Um, but uh, if a, if this difference turns out to be significant, then I wouldn't be as surprised, right? Because um, because then the model estimate the model results would actually correspond to what I'm seeing in the means. So always look at the means. If uh, the model contradicts the means, then uh, the model has a problem. Unless you you for some reason you know exactly uh, why the means in this case are not informative. But that would be a very special case where you are where you are where you already know what's going on and you know what the model is doing. If you don't, if you don't know, if, and it would be hard to think of a situation like that. Always take the means over the model. It's, that's a very important lesson and it has uh, saved me from uh, making some pretty bad errors. So, so just remember that. Always trust the actual means from your data. Always trust your data. Don't trust the model. If the model doesn't seem to be reflecting the data, something's wrong with the model. It's not that something's wrong with the data, right? And it's also not, uh, this is something that, um, especially when, when you're using more complex uh, models like LMMs, is that uh, what some people start to think is that, oh, uh, well, maybe the, maybe the model uh, somehow gets some, magical aspects from the data that we can't see if we just look at the means. No, that it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. If uh, your model um, output, if your model fit doesn't make sense, there's a problem with your model, right? And then, uh, so, so then look at your model and work on your model until it can actually, it actually fits what uh, the data is saying. And most of the time you're just misinterpreting the model when that happens. So then work on the model interpretation. Okay, so for this first uh, linear mixed model, um, we will use the default contrast. 
that so every time you make a variable into a factor in in R, it automatically assigns a set of contrasts. And if you don't tell it anything else, um, it will assign treatment contrasts. So these contrasts compare the second, third, fourth, and so on level, depending on how many levels your, uh, your factor has, to the first level. So now you see why it's so important to make sure uh, that you know what your first level is, right? Otherwise, you might be, uh, if you're using these default contrasts, then you might be using contrasts that um, don't really reflect uh, what, what you want to test, right? And um, and even worse, if you if you think that your contrasts reflect something different from what they actually reflect, that's when you can get into the situation that uh, where what you think the model is telling you is different from the data. Uh, and then again, trust the data and look at what's wrong with the model and what's wrong with my interpretation of the model. And I've had this. I've had this happen to me many times, where I thought, "Why? Why doesn't this uh, this contrast make sense? It doesn't seem to reflect the data." And then I realize, "Oh, this is actually not the contrast that I want." Okay, so we're just uh, yeah. Again, we're just using preview. Uh, we've just uh, earlier two slides ago, right? We've set preview to be a factor and we've made sure that we know that correct is the first level here, right? If you don't specify anything, then it will just do the levels either um, by numeric order. So if you have levels uh, one, two, three, four, then it will assign one as the first one, right? Um, or if you have text, it will um, do it by, or it will do it alphabetically. And that is usually not what you want. So in this case, correct will be the first level just because it happens to be alphabetically first. Um, but for example, orthographic uh, will come before repeated. Um, and that might not be what you are expecting, right? So that's why I always, uh, always say just uh, take the tiny little bit of extra work. It takes, I don't know, 30 seconds to write this or, or a minute to write this. Take the, take the, do the little bit of extra work so that you know exactly what your levels are and what the order is. Okay, so the base, so we compare the second, third, fourth level to the first one. Um, so you get n minus one contrast where n is the number of factor levels. So for five factor levels that we have, we get four contrasts for, or you could also say four degrees of freedom, right? Um, and in order to use these contrasts, we don't have to do anything again. We just have to put in a variable into the model that is, um, that is a factor and that hasn't had any other contrast assigned to it. Now, um, if you, if for some reason I hadn't uh, done this, uh, this command here, I hadn't run uh, the factor command, um, this would still work. This, com this next command where I fit the LMM would still work. Um, the problem is that, uh, well, in many ways, R tries to be nice and helpful. So it's just simply when, when you give a variable, so when you try to fit a linear mixed model with a variable, and, and it also works for a standard regression model, with a variable that's just text, then it will be automatically and silently converted into a factor. So it will quietly run the factor command here, right? And um, of course, that means it will, um, it will use the alphabetical factor levels, right? And then it will apply treatment contrasts automatically, right? And that way you get a result here, but um, unless you are completely aware of that, of the fact that 
that is what this command is doing, that it is silently putting in, uh, making this into a factor and putting in treatment contrast and uh, putting the factor levels in alphabetical order, unless you are completely aware of it and it is what you want to do, um, it is always better to, um, to do this explicitly. So just make everything uh, that you need to be a factor into a factor um, explicitly in your R code and for the factors where you actually care about the uh, conditions, uh, that is your fixed effects, right? Um, assign, make sure that you assign the level order explicitly. Um, so a dummy contrast, well, it, it depends on um, it depends on the author. Some people call everything dummy contrast. Every everything every contrast that um, that so okay. Sorry, I had the question uh, in the chat. What is a co dummy contrast then? Um, so some people call all contrasts where you assign uh, numbers to factor levels dummy contrasts. I don't think that is correct. Um, some people call um, treatment contrasts dummy contrast. So where um, where it's essentially the same because they say it's the simplest kind of contrast. Um, it's usually the one that's taught uh, first. So that's what uh, that's what we say is a dummy contrast. Okay. So so usually when people say dummy contrast, they will mean treatment contrast. Um, some people use it interchangeably, so uh, so either one is fine. Although in a in a research paper, I would usually write uh, treatment contrast because that's unambiguous. So you um, so uh, that people don't wonder, yeah, dummy contrast, but which one, right? So um, so I would always write treatment contrast. Okay, so let's look at um, the linear mixed model then. Okay, so the dependent variable is uh, G, uh, Z, D, N1. Okay, so that's just the way I abbreviate gaze duration. Uh, so again, just like you, like you know from last time, so we give it the data, the data frame, then we, um, have the dependent variable, so the variable or the predicted variable, then we have the tilde here, and then we have uh, our main effect or our variable, so our main effect here, pre of preview, and that's our only variable in this analysis, so we don't have any interactions. And then we are putting in random intercepts for subjects and items. And we will talk about why we are only using random intercepts here uh, in a little bit. Um, and then again, the intercept, if you don't write anything else, you have to put a one here. So you can't leave this part empty. If you have something else here like preview, um, then you, you could, I could write one plus preview and that would give me the exact same model, but I can also just leave the one out. And the same thing here. So the one stands for the intercept. So random intercept by subject, random intercept by item. Okay, so this is what we get. Um, and this is what we get. So uh, model formula. Um, notice that we have we have um, loaded Elmer test before running this. So that's why. Uh, this is, that's why we get this message. T-tests use setethrates method. We'll talk about that in a second. And Elmer mod, Elmer tests. Okay, so, um, so this is the class of, of the object here of LMM1 is class Elmer mod, Elmer test, which is a, uh, Elmer mod is just the, a model fitted by Elm, right? And then Elmer mod, Elmer test is, a model fitted by Elmer, but uh, but Elmer test modifies that class to also give you uh, p-values. Okay, 
Oops, go back here. All right, so we get the Ramel criterion at convergence. Um, in general, I always think it's a good idea to, um, well, if you, if you are reasonably competent with a statistical method, you should be able to explain everything that the output gives you, right? Uh, it's fine to say, to say, okay, I don't really care about this bit of the output. I mean, especially if you, uh, if you're used to using SPSS, you say that with a, a huge bit of the output, but you should at least know what it is, right? So, okay, then we get the formula. That's clear. That's pretty clear. Then we get uh, what data we're we using for the data frame. Then we get this uh, Remel criterion at convergence. So last week I told you that um, if what we care about are the fixed effects, uh, we want to fit the model using restricted maximum likelihood. So that's also what it says here. Linear mix model fits by restricted maximum likelihood. I also told you last week, don't, don't worry too much about um, the difference between restricted maximum likelihood and maximum likelihood. Essentially, restricted maximum likelihood just gives better results with fixed, uh, when you are better um, significant tests for fixed effects. So you should use that. And it's the, stand, the standard that, um, that Elmer always uses. So the Remel criterion at convergence, that means uh, this is the um, likelihood or rather the deviance, uh, which is the deviance, if you remember from last time is um, minus two times uh, log likelihood. And it's just a, it's just a way, uh, it has some other convenient properties, but it's this, it's especially, it's essentially a way to make, uh, to transform maxima, to transform likelihood, which is a very small value uh, usually into something that's more like uh, error variance, right? So like the unexplained, the residual, you can, uh, so, so that's why the smaller this is, the better. Right. Okay. Then we've got the residuals. So um, this just gives you an idea of the distribution of residuals. Okay. So what's the minimum residual uh, and scale? So it's uh, it's basically um, by uh, so these are these are standard deviations, right? So so are z values. Okay. So. The smallest residual is minus 2.23. So it's fairly far away. Um, then you have, um, of course the mean, the mean is, is zero. Uh, the median is a little bit to the left of the mean. So, so you can get sort of an idea of the, the distribution of the residuals here. Um, and you can, you can actually see, uh, you get a bit of a, of a long tail here, right? So, um, so the minimum residual is a lot closer to the mean than the maximum residual. And also the first quartile is a lot closer to the mean than the third quartile. And we'll, we'll come back to this all the way at the end uh, when we talk about that. Okay, so then um, we have our total number of, oh, sorry, then we have our random effects. Okay, so we've got our item variance. And, and here, so mostly um, don't worry about the absolute values, right? It's more, more important to, uh, to look at sort of the relative, uh, the relative value. So we have the residual, which is usually the biggest number here because that's the, the variance that's not explained. Um, by the way, the standard deviation here is just the square root of the variance. So you can look at either either one of these, right? Um, then you've got the um, the subject variance, which is um, compared to the residual variance, it's not that much, but it it probably does help the model. Um, and then the item variance, which is not very much. That is that is what you usually see. So usually there's more systematic variance um, in a language experiment uh, for subjects than 
than four items, although it, it really does depend on what kind of experiment it is and what, uh, what kind of items you have. Okay, then we have number of observations. Uh, so we have 119 items, uh, 40 subjects. So here you can see um, it's a little maybe, so, so just quickly check, uh, do you know why, um, do you know uh, why these numbers are there? So is this actually the number of items you had in your analysis? Is this actually the number of subjects that you had in your analysis? If this doesn't correspond, then for some reason, some people are maybe being excluded accidentally, or if it's too high, uh, then maybe you're not, uh, your factors are not, or your, yeah, your random factors are not what you think they are, right? So make sure that it all makes sense. Um, so you've got, um, so yeah, you've got the, um, you've got, um, your subjects and your items here. Uh, what's interesting is that items is uh, 119. Uh, when it, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think it's supposed to be 120. So one item was excluded at some point, uh, probably because it didn't work or there was some problem with it. So. Sometimes what happens is you, you notice later that there was a spelling error in that particular item, or just that people really got the comprehension question for that right item wrong, that they were behaving strangely on that. And then um, you might decide to exclude it from the analysis. But here, if, uh, if you don't know the explanation why it is just, for example, 119 instead of 120, then also take a look to see what's going on with your model. So don't, don't take all of this just as, as sort of random noise. Instead, look at it and see um, if it all makes sense. It's fine to say, yeah, okay, makes sense. I'll read on, right? But, um, but at least check it. Don't just ignore it. This, uh, in our, usually if there's information printed, it's useful information, right? Okay, you've got the fixed effects, and this is where it gets interesting, right? So you've got you've got intercept, then you've got four the four contrasts, and R has automatically named them: preview repeated, preview orthographic, preview semantic, preview unrelated. Okay, and then repeated and orthographic. These contrasts are significant, right? You so you see the significance codes that is printed here. The intercept is also significant, although I, if the intercept is significant, that just means that the intercept um, is significantly different from zero, uh, since uh, it would be very surprising to have a, an average gauge duration of zero, um, that it's, it's not particularly informative to say, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's clearly very different from zero. It's very, very, very far away from zero, 239, right? Okay. Um, and then we have, uh, finally, we have the correlation of fixed effects. So you can see these, so all of these contrasts are correlated to a certain extent. Right? It's not a huge correlation, so that's fine. But with treatment contrasts, that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, treatment contrasts, uh, it's called not orthogonal, which means that they are correlated. And we'll talk about why that is in a second, but you can see the impact of it here. It's not enough to cause problems with multicollinearity. So multicollinearity is the problem that you get when um, your predictors are correlated amongst themselves, right? And that uh, if that correlation is very high, it can lead to a problem in actually determining the, um, the appropriate model. So it leads to, um, right? Because um, if you, in the extreme case, if you have two predictors that are basically equivalent because they are perfectly correlated, then how are you going to determine um, which one of them, um, 
which one of them should uh, should, for example, get the higher coefficient, and which one should get a lower coefficient. Um, you could split up the coefficients in any in any possible way if they're perfectly correlated. So that's why, in that case, even a, a, a normal a standard multiple regression will not work. Um, but in any case, uh, having this multicollinearity will cause your standard error to be a lot higher. Um, so in this case, it doesn't affect the standard error much. Um, but if you had very highly correlated um, predictors or contrasts here, so maybe something above 0.8, then possibly you would get, um, you would get to the point where you can't actually tell uh, which one of these contrasts is, um, is actually explaining the effect. And where, so where there's the significant difference and where, where there isn't. And that will lead to you um, essentially not being able to use these coefficient p-tests. Okay, let's, uh, let's go on and look at the output. Let, let's look at the, the fixed effects in um, just a little bit more detail, okay? So we've got the estimate. So that's the estimate for the coefficient, right? Uh, we've got the standard error. We've got the degrees of freedom. And we'll talk about why the degrees of freedom are the way they are. And then we've got the t value. I don't know how many of you have realized that the um, t value is the estimate div divided by the standard error. Um, I, um, it, it took me a while to realize that too when I was a, uh, when I was a PhD student. But once, once you know it, that's, um, that makes things a lot clearer to you, right? So standard S, you have the estimate, you have the standard error of the estimate. Uh, so as always, the t-value is sort of a standardized version of the, of the estimate that tells you this is how far away uh, this is from zero, right? Um, and then finally, we've got the p-value, which is, um, which of course tells you, and, and I'll go into more detail there, uh, which later, which tells you what the probability is of um, observing a t-value this extreme. So for example, a t-value of 2.8, minus 2.8 or plus 2.8, or more extreme, given that the null hypothesis is true. And now let's talk about what this null hypothesis here actually is. So what's the null hypothesis that is tested by this contrast that R calls preview repeated? Okay, so remember for the treatment or dummy contrasts, um, the baseline is always the first level, okay? so. Here the baseline is the level correct. Okay, this is not this is not a terrible baseline because that is actually our control condition. Okay, so that's also why I put it in the first position here. Okay, so the intercept in this in in a model with dummy contrasts reflects the average gaze duration in this condition in the correct condition. So two hundred thirty nine point nine seven. Notice that this is a tiny, if we go back to our estimate, it's a tiny little bit different from uh, the actual means in the, um, in the data. And that is because these are just uh, the fixed effects. Remember that uh, the model also estimates the random effects, right? And some people might have more observations than other people. So that might affect things. In any case, it's not too far off. So, it's almost, this is almost 240 and the, the mean we get in the data is 241. So it's almost in the area of, of rounding error, right? Okay, so, um, so the intercept um, reflects the model estimate for the baseline, okay? Um, then um, each slope, so slopes being the different contrasts, right? Uh, is the difference between the baseline 
and the corresponding level. So, um, so here, the, the contrast that, uh, that R calls preview repeated is the difference between the baseline, which is, um, which is correct, and uh, the repeated condition. It's actually, it's, it's actually uh, the difference. So the difference is actually repeated minus correct. OK, so to be, to be very exact. So if we get minus 12.33 milliseconds here in the estimate, that means that the average gaze duration in the repeated condition is, is then 239 plus this minus 12.33. Uh, so that means we get, we're getting 227.64. So the model says that, um, that the repeated condition was about 12.33 milliseconds faster than the uh, correct condition. Okay, which again, if we go back to the means, that's about right, right? 229, 241, that's about 12 milliseconds. Well, it's exactly 12 milliseconds, but this is rounded, so. So we don't know if it's if it's exactly 12 milliseconds to uh, if we if we look at the uh, the digits later on, but it's it's good enough for our purposes, right? It's just um, here the the model clearly corresponds to uh, our means. Small deviations from the means are fine. It's just we don't we don't want to see a completely different pattern. Okay, and um, then. Um, then, of course, the t value and the p value indicate that this difference is significant. We can do the same for all our contrasts, right? We can do the same. So, preview orthographic means this is the difference. So, this is uh, orthographic, the gaze duration in the, the mean gaze duration in the orthographic condition minus the mean gaze duration in the correct condition. And there, the difference is minus nine, nine point. Uh, Six 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 two eight nine. So this means that the orthographic condition was nine, about nine, well, almost ten milliseconds faster than the correct condition. Again, we can look here. So two hundred forty-one, two hundred thirty-two. Yep, yeah, that's that's nine. Uh, that's nine milliseconds. Okay, so just about right. And we can. Um, we can keep going with that, right? So semantic versus versus correct. Uh, semantic was one millisecond longer than correct. Uh, unrelated versus correct. Unrelated was two milliseconds longer. So here, um, in both cases, it it looks like two milliseconds, but it could just be rounding, right? It could be a, a rounding issue. Okay. In any case, it's close enough so that I'm that I'm satisfied that this model is uh, a good reflection of the means that I actually observe in the data. Okay. All right. Uh, another way to interpret the model would be to use the ANOVA command. Okay. So here, um, and again, this. So if I'm using, if I am actually using uh, Elmer test, this is what I will get. Uh, type three analysis of variance table with setter weights method. Okay, and then um, and then instead of the um, instead of the four contrasts for preview, here we just have preview as one uh, as one factor. So. Because this is an analysis of variance table, now um, what we're doing is uh, we're no longer comparing a model where one of those slopes is zero to a model where, uh, where we have all the slopes, right? And, and see if it makes any difference in the explained variance. Now we're comparing a model that doesn't have any of the preview factor, but it has all other predictors. Now, in this case, of course, we don't have any other predictors. We just have the intercept. But um, if you have more than if you have more than one predictor, then 
in the model that this is compared to, all of these uh, will still be in the model, in the, uh, in the restricted model, mm. including any interactions. So if, let's say I had, uh, I had a factor that was word frequency, low versus high, and I had, um, I didn't actually in this case, but let's imagine I had, and I had an interaction, so preview by word frequency here. Then in a type three table, um, I would compare the model with word frequency preview and, um, and word frequency by preview, so the interaction, with a model that just has word frequency and word frequency by preview. Okay, so that's the type three analysis of variance table. Um, there's, you can also do a type two table, which, uh, would, in, which would exclude the, um, the interaction. And some people say that that makes more sense, but um, essentially, SPSS has popularized the type three tables, so everyone is using them now. But just because that was the, the default result, the default output in SPSS. So you just have to, uh, you just have to make sure that you, um, that you appreciate that, well, what does it mean to, to compare a model um, that doesn't have a main effect but has an interaction, right, to a model that uh, that has both the main effect and the interaction. It's it's a bit it's a bit weird, but most of the time um, it this distinction doesn't really matter. I mean, in this case, uh, type three and type two analyses would be um, exactly the same because we don't even have interactions in here. Okay, but essentially what this says is right that um, that um, the that so you you calculate it calculates the sum of squares explained by the preview factor just like a just like a an analysis of variance right um, then it divides this by the degrees of freedom which gives you the mean squares okay so um, and then and then in a in a normal analysis of variance right this um, this uh, the so you um, so in a, a normal analysis of variance you get you take these mean squares of the effect and um, divide them by the mean squares error and you get the f value and that's that's what you do here too, only that um, actually, so actually uh, what, what you get here is this, this test statistic is, uh, well, it's not exactly an F, an F value, but you can make it to be an F value by picking uh, the correct, uh, denominator degrees of freedom, which in this case here is uh, this 3485.9. And you've noticed if you if you are very if you're familiar with uh, with ANOVAs, you've noticed that uh, you shouldn't be able to have um, degrees of freedom that aren't uh, whole numbers except if you, if you do the, um, the corrections for sphericity, right? There you can also have degrees of freedom that aren't whole numbers. So what this is, is actually, it's this is actually an approximation to the degrees of freedom, um, or, or in other ways, the, in, a, in a different way of saying it, with these degrees of freedom, the F value here, um, so with, if you're using these degrees of freedom, you can interpret this, t this statistic here. So you can interpret this test statistic like an F value with these degrees of freedom. And that makes it possible then, of course, to say, um, to look up essentially, what is the probability of getting an F value this high 
with these degrees of freedom, given that the null hypothesis is true. Okay? And from that, you get the p value, which is 0 0.00096. So very small, right? And this is because, um, again, this is because the linear mixed model uses, ran, uh, uses maximum likelihood or restricted maximum likelihood rather than least squares, which is what um, multiple regression and basically um, ANOVA uh, normally use, right? So uh, this adjustment um, of the degree, denominator degrees of freedom is called Tethwaite's method, okay? And actually, um, in the, the people who developed the ELMA test package, they've, um, so originally Satterthwaite's uh, method was um, intended for F values. Um, it is also used by the way to, um, if, you, if you remember, if you've had um, introduction to statistics at some point you will have, um, you will have uh, learned about uh, the t-test for unequal variances, so Welch's t-test. This is also called the Welch uh, set of weight t-test, okay? So it's, it's used in a case where you have different variances and you're trying to get uh, basically degrees of freedom and a, and a variance estimate from these different um, variances in the data, right? So that's set of weights method. Um, so they were able to um, adapt Satterthwaite's method um, so that it would also work for T values, which is not that, that hard because T values and F values are very closely related, right? So, but because of this, uh, we get, uh, so we can get with ELMA test, uh, both T tests with Satterthwaite's method with P values uh, for the coefficients here. Right, so so these um, these test statistics are t follow a t distribution um, if you're using these degrees of freedom for the t values, right? And same thing, same thing here, uh, same thing here. The this test statistic follows the f distribution, given that the null hypothesis is true, of course, and uh, you're using an F distribution with this uh, with this denominator degrees of freedom, and of course, numerator degrees of freedom are four because we have a factor with five levels. Okay, so uh, so it used to be it used to be a huge issue that you couldn't get p values from uh, linear mixed models because um, it wasn't clear what the degrees of freedom should be. For the for the uh, t test statistic for the and for the f test statistic here, um, it wasn't clear what that um, what that p value should be. Um, but thanks to the people who've developed um, Elma test, I mean, there's really there is really no reason not to use it. It's um, it is fast. It gives you uh, it gives you p-values that are um, that um, are appropriate to use. Um, if you're interested, you can always read the the paper on Elmer tests if you're interesting interested in why they are in general. But but yeah, it's just made using linear mixed models so much easier. And of course, if you use SPSS, they use the same. Um, they use the same approximation. They use the same uh, method to get uh, p-values for linear mixed models. So, so also, if you want your your results to be comparable with SPSS, then then you can use that. Okay. So, um, you should briefly mention in the results section. This applies uh, no matter whether you're using SPSS or R or any other program. You should say that you used uh, set of weights method to um, estimate degrees of freedom and p-values, and that you used the ELMA test 
uh, if you're using Elmer test with R, that you use that package to get that so that um, people know this is, this is where the p-values came from and uh, can replicate it. Okay. All right. So now let's uh, let's get more into the topic of contrasts because um, this is really something that um, well it is something that you sort of need because you you will use contrasts in some way even if you even if you don't specify them then you will just use treatment contrasts right um, and it's also something it's a it's a type of complexity that uh, you can avoid when you use an ANOVA, right? Because um, for the ANOVA type, for an ANOVA, just like here, you don't have to worry about which contrasts are being used. You just interpret a model with all the contrasts or without all the contrasts or, or, or with the categorical variable, the factor, or without the factor, right? So, um, so you don't have to worry about what the contrasts actually are. But this comes at a cost of um, you not using the capability of the model. I mean, you, you, in order to fit the model, you need to use contrasts anyway. Uh, you can use default contrasts and just not interpret them, right? Uh, but what's the, but, uh, but yeah, but, that is just uh, it's it just it is just a waste in a way because you can you you get the contrast sort of for free as part of your analysis so you might as well use them to test some of the hypotheses that you have about the data and that uh, can also help you to avoid uh, you having to use post hoc tests um, to determine for example which of the um, which of the level uh, which of the levels are actually significant? Yes, and I and I just see that uh, that Ronaldo is um, is clarifying uh, this in the chat. Um, so the Elma test package, yes, the Elma test package uh, builds on the Elma package, and it essentially modifies the LMER command and the summary command um, to um, apply Setterthwaite's method and get p-values, okay? So if you, are, if you are just using LME4 and you don't load Elma test as well, then you're not going to get p-values. Um, if you are using Elma test as well, then you are going to get p-values. And I, I would just recommend just always Always load LME4 and Elma test. If you if you forget to load LME4, um, Elma test will actually do it for you as well. But I would I would still load them both. And that's also where you don't have to worry about which one you're going to load first. With some packages, you have to worry about it. But um, yes, exactly because Elma test always loads Elma first, um, even if so. If Elma isn't uh, sorry, if LME4 isn't loaded then Elmer test will load LME4 first, and then it will overwrite the functions, the LMER function and the summary function, so that you definitely get the, um, the, correct, um, the correct outputs. If you, um, if you actually, so let's say, not a lot of people do this, but I, I used to do this sometimes in the past, if you save an, um, an LMER output from just LME4 into an R data file, and then you load it later and you have L LMER test loaded and try to get the summary uh, of, that, of that model, then you will actually get an error. And then it will tell you this is not the correct uh, kind of object because, um, because you've generated the object using just LMER from the LME4 package, but you're now trying to, um, get the summary using the uh, LMER test function. Okay, so let's, uh, let's keep going. So again, yeah, you can use the LMM just like an ANOVA, but um, that way, in that way, you're not getting all out of your uh, analysis that you can, and you would have to do postdoc tests, which 
then you would have to correct for multiple comparisons and you would lose power. Um, so why not use contrasts, okay? So again, treatment contrasts are default and automatically applied. And it's always good to know that these are the contrasts that are automatically applied um, and how they are applied. So you can always get out to actually print out um, what these contrasts are. So here, this one is, uh, is very simple. It's just zero, uh, it's just zeros and ones. So the, um, the baseline is set to zero. Um, and then for each contrast, so this is the, this is the first contrast, right? Um, for each contrast, um, the, so always the baseline is set to zero. Then here, because we want to con compare the second level to the first level, uh, the second level is set to one, all the rest is set to zero. Here, um, because we want to compare the, um, the third level to the first level, only the third level is one, everything else is zero, and so on. That's, that's how, uh, how this works. And it is um, important to note that these contrasts, again, are not orthogonal. So that means they may be correlated with each other because they all depend on the, um, on the baseline. If you have, a, if you compare all, all levels, all conditions to the baseline, then of course the outcome of those comparisons will depend on what the baseline is. Okay, so that's why they are all correlated. And you can see here from our analysis, uh, you can see that's where these correlations of fixed effects come from, right? Because we, the only fixed effects we have are the contrasts. Because they're treatment contrasts, they are correlated with each other because again, they all depend on the value of the um, of the baseline, which here is two thirty nine point nine seven one. Okay, so those are not the only contrasts that you can use. So um, you, for example, you can use some contrasts. Um, they differ from the treatment contrasts in that um, the intercept and the baseline, so the thing that you're comparing everything against, um, no longer corresponds to the um, mean of the first condition, but instead it corresponds to the mean of all condition means. Okay, so basically you are testing now, you're now testing each. Um, condition mean against the mean of all the condition means. Okay, so, so it would be, it's, it's like saying, okay, we are, we are calculating, uh, well, yeah, we're calculating here, we are taking um, the mean of all of these, and now we are testing, we are essentially testing the null hypothesis that the difference between this mean and the mean of all five means is zero, or that the difference of this mean and the mean of all five means is zero, and so on. Now, of course, you only get four contrasts, right? You get um, you get these ones. Notice that it names them two, three, four, five because um, well, oh no, sorry. That was the treatment contrast because two, three, four, five was two versus one, three, four, one. Here we just have the, the column labels one, two, three, four. Also notice that because we have only four contrasts, we, um, we only get four comparisons. So um, we don't get the comparison between the last, uh, the last level and the overall mean. Um, so here, let's, uh, let's just try what, what happens if we apply this to um, our analysis, right? So um, we can apply the contrasts that are predefined in R just by using the assignment operator. So this is the, um, this is of course, again, the, the little arrow sign 
here um, we assign, so we essentially just assign the function contrast.sum to the contrasts of uh, e dollar sign preview. You could write contrast sum five. So, uh, so what I what I did here, but R is actually smart and fills it in automatically if you just write contrast dot sum. Okay, um, and that is all it that is all it takes. And then you can fit the model again. So here I'm just going to call this LMM two, um, and it's the exact same command. It's just now that we've changed the contrasts, the of course our results are going to be different because they will reflect the comparisons made in the contrast. So if we look at the LMM summary now, right? So we still we still get um, not exactly the same Ramel criterion, but a but a very similar one, right? Because um, the we'll talk about convergence uh, a little bit later on, but um, what contrasts you use can affect convergence and can affect how long it takes to get convergence. And the idea is that with maximum likelihood, um, you're not always going to get convergence at exactly the same point, although it's going to be close. Okay, so random effects uh, are pretty much the same. Uh, residuals are also the, I think, pretty much the exact same um, as before. But now we get, uh, of course, we get different, um, we get different um, contrasts. So now, because uh, here, uh, this, this matrix is just, the column names are just one, two, three, four, right? So, um, so here, these contrasts are also just labeled one, two, three, four. Okay, and then, so they're contrasts for the factor preview, and they're the contrast one, two, three, four, that correspond to the first, second, third, fourth column of the contrast matrix here. Okay, so preview one, we have an estimate of 3.788, um, and then we got standard error, degrees freedom, just the same as before, it's not significant. Um, so what's that 3.788? seven, nine that we get. So again, the, the baseline is the mean of, is the mean of condition means, okay? So it's all of, it's basically you sum up all of the condition means and divide by five, right? That's, that's the mean. Um, so the intercept reflects the mean of the means of the, sorry, that should read five conditions, uh, which is here 23, uh, sorry, 20, 236 0.18 milliseconds, right? Again, a, a little bit, a little bit different from what we got, uh, we got before. Why is it different? Uh, so, well, it's a little bit different from the, um, from the means that we have estimated here, but it's close enough if we, if we took the average of all of uh, of all of these, it would it would end up close, but not exactly there. Of course, it's different from 239 because now uh, the intercept uh, no longer reflects the first the mean of the first condition, but instead it reflects the mean of uh, condition means, right? So the and here the model's estimate, at least for the fixed effects, of the mean of condition means is 236. Uh, 0.18. Okay, and then each slope is the difference between the baseline, which is the mean of condition means, and the corresponding level. So preview one is the difference between correct and the mean of the four conditions. So that's 3.79. So the estimated average gaze duration, sorry, this, this slide has a few typos. I'll, I'll fix them after this. This should read in the correct condition, right? Because that's our first condition. Uh, in the correct condition is 236.18 um, plus 3.79 equals 239.97. And this is the same estimate, of course, that we got from the treatment contrast. Okay. 
So we are we are dealing with the same estimated condition means. We're just splitting them up and calculating differences in a different way, right? And and every time we're doing this, we're of course testing, is this uh, significantly different from zero? Okay, or, or in other words, is what is the probability of getting a T value as extreme or more extreme as the one we observe, given that the null hypothesis that this difference is actually zero is true. And based on that, we get the, P value, and if the p value is smaller than 0.05, uh, usually we reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so um, so yeah, so it's not uh, it's not that surprising that um, that the um, first so that the correct condition is not different from the mean of it's not significantly different from the mean of means, um, and then. We do get a significant result for preview two, which is the repeated condition, and preview three. So those are significantly smaller than the mean of means. And the fourth condition, so the um, semantically related condition, um, is, um, well, the p-value is close, but it doesn't reach uh, 0.05. So there we can't reject the null hypothesis that this one is significantly larger than the, um, than the mean of means. Now, um, again, there's no uh, comparison for the fifth condition. Um, although if you wanted to get the estimate, um, you would just have to sum up these estimates for, um, preview one, preview two, preview three, and preview four. And, um, and well, the, the estimate for the fifth preview uh, would has to, so the estimate of all the five, because they are all uh, differences to the overall, uh, to the mean of condition mean. Um, so, so basically we could add, we could add all of these up uh, and then see, um, what is left. So in this case, I've, um, I've done that. I've not, I don't have it in the slides, but it's about 5.7. And so you get about minus 5.7. So because all of the five differences from the mean of means have to add up to zero, right? So um, because the mean, because these are all differences from the mean of the five of them, right? Um, they all, all estimates for the contrast need to sum to zero. Uh, so need to sum to, well, all, S, all differences need to sum to zero, right? So, um, so basically if we have 3.7 plus, plus minus 8.5 plus minus 5.87 plus uh, 4.81, we end up with minus 5.7 something. So the 5.7 is what's missing uh, to get uh, to get it to sum to zero. So the uh, so the fifth condition is 5.7 milliseconds above this uh, this mean. So two point um, about 2.42, and um, well, not not that much different from the fourth one. And again, if you look at the actual condition means here, um, in the condition means, there's actually no difference at all. Okay, but of course you don't get a test. So you can't test that difference. Um, you would just have to reorder the levels if you wanted to actually test that difference. Now, this particular, these particular contrasts are not terribly helpful for what we're trying to do, right? They're not, um, actually the treatment contrasts are more helpful than these ones because we don't really care about the, the how much these deviate from the mean. So that's why there's some contrasts are also called deviation means. So, um, so we don't care that much about how much each of the 
uh, condition means deviates from the overall mean of condition means, but uh, we care about comparisons between the control condition and or comparison in, and the individual conditions, which is what the treatment contrast give us. And we care about um, comparisons between uh, the individual level. So we, for example, the comparison between the repeated and the orthographically related condition would be interesting. Okay, so we can make our own contrast actually. And this is a very useful skill to have. So, uh, because that way you can just make your own contrast that correspond exactly to the hypotheses that you are testing. You need to make your own contrast matrix, but it is easier than it sounds, okay? So in general, your contrast will test a null hypothesis of the type level X minus level Y equals zero, right? So for example, if I want to test the difference between um, the correct condition and the repeated condition, then my null hypothesis would be mean of correct minus mean of repeated equals zero, right? Or we could also have a, a condition, we could have a comparison like um, if I, so like the mean of two conditions uh, minus the mean of another condition should be zero. So for example, I could say, um, well, maybe the um, maybe the I want well maybe I want to test the hypothesis whether it matters if you uh, if you actually have the correct repeated word, uh, sorry, if you have the correct post boundary word, or if you have a different word, right? Um, so, so not looking at the repeated words, but just comparing, uh, just comparing um, the semantically related and the unrelated to the um, to the correct condition, right? And so we could just say, well, I I just want to see because the semantically related and the um, and the unrelated conditions are actually quite similar. If you remember, they were tail and Tule with T U L E. Um, it would make sense to just take the mean of those, and that's what that's what this is doing, right? So level X plus level Y divided by two minus level Z equals zero. Okay, so this is also a valid null hypothesis that you can test with contrast. Okay, so in order to get the contrast, we just need to uh, write these uh, equations a little bit differently. So you need to make sure to include all the levels and you can just multiply them with zero if they don't matter for this particular comparison and then express each of these comparisons as products. Okay, so it's easier to, to understand if I, if I just show you how that works. So for the first comparison, we, could have, we would have one, so positive one times level X plus minus one times level y plus zero times level z because level z is not even, uh, it's not in this comparison. So we just multiply it with zero um, equals zero. Okay. So that's how we get one minus one and zero. Okay. For the second comparison, well, level x divided by two is the same as 0.5 uh, times level x. Level y divided by two is the same as 0.5 times level y. Okay, so we have 0.5 or one half times level x plus one half times level y plus minus one times level z. And that should also um, add up to zero. Okay, because these are, um, these are differences. So because we have minus in, in these, usually these numbers uh, should sum up to zero. Right, because if they don't sum up to zero, um, it's hard to tell, to interpret what the comparison is supposed to be, right? Um, so, so here, for example, um, one minus one is of course zero, or in the other, in the second example, 
0.5 plus 0.5 minus 1 is again 0, right? Um, and the second one is just a convention, but it's also useful to keep in mind. The absolute value should sum up to 0. So the absolute value is just um, the value of the number without any sign, right? So, um, so the absolute value of 1 is 1. The absolute value of minus 1 is also 1. So you just absolute value just means you take away the sign, right? Um, so one plus one is two. So uh, these contrasts um, and the, and the same for 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 plus absolute value of minus one, which is one. So it's 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 plus one. That also sums up to zero. So that's just uh, that is just a convention that you want to have it this way because it makes sure that the contrasts are scaled approximately the same way for each of your comparisons. OK, so if we wanted to make these contrasts, so these, so for this example, I've just had three levels, right? So this would be, this would be two valid contrasts for, uh, for a factor with three levels, right? Where you can have two contrasts. So you can just take the numbers from these equations, put them in the contrast matrix. There are many ways of making a contrast matrix. I found that for myself, the one that's easiest to um, sort of wrap my head around is to just define each contrast in a, um, using C. So first contrast C one comma minus one comma zero, and then define the second contrast using another C uh, here. So uh, C point, 0 0.5 comma 0 0.5 comma minus one. And then I bind those two together as columns using C bind. Okay, as I said, there, there are many ways of doing this, uh, but this is the one that makes the most sense to me and it's the easiest for me to, um, when I look at it a few months later to understand what I was doing. And then as you see, as you can see, this prints out uh, just fine. Okay, now uh, let's, Let's come up with some example contrasts in our analysis. Of course, we have we have five levels, so that makes things a little bit more complicated. But um, but we can do it. I mean, if we use if we just use this method of um, of expressing these as equations or as sums to zero, right? Then um, then it's not that hard. So basically, um, the one of the hypotheses that we are really interested in with this study uh, is, um, does it matter if the preview, so if what you have to the right of where you're looking, shares letters with the word that you're looking at? So of course, in that, that is true for the second and the third condition, and it's not true for the other condition. So I could, I could just compare the mean of the repeated and the orthographic condition to the mean of the other three. And of course, in order to get a mean, I have to sum up the average, uh, the average of news and the average of knives. I don't know how to pronounce that, N-I-W-S, and divide it by two because it's two values. So that's how I get the average. And then I sum up the, the averages of the other three and divide it by three. Right, so that's how I that's how I get to this, um, and I've just put them here in well, I've put them here in that order because that is the order in which the factor levels are in R. Right, so I get one third times once, minus one half times news, minus one half times NIWS, plus one third times tail, plus one third times TULE. And these are the means, right? Uh, equals zero. Okay, and so that gives me my first contrast. That gives me the values for my first contrast. Again, if you if you check, do they sum up to zero? Uh, yes. So these ones minus one half plus minus one half sums up to minus one. Uh, one third plus one third plus one third sums up to one. So um, yeah, this sums up to zero. Does it sum up, does the um, absolute value sum up to two? Yes, it does, right? Because one third plus one third plus one third is one. 
one half plus one half is also one, so one plus one is two. Okay, uh, then for our next contrast, um, we can compare the repeated and the orthographically related cities. So here we ask the question, um, does, it, does it matter? Does it make a difference if um, we share all four letters uh, and if it's a word, so if it's an exact repetition, or is it enough if we're just repeating three letters, right? So, so here we, um, we would just do, um, well, I want the difference of uh, N-I-W-S minus news, right? And this is what we're getting. So, so none of the other ones matter in this comparison. So they're all, we're all having, using zero. So zero times ones minus one times news, because that's one of the uh, two that we want to compare, plus one times N-I-W-S, plus zero times tail, plus zero times T-U-L-E. And uh, again, that gives us zero. And, and again, this fulfills our criteria. Minus one plus one is zero. And absolute values, one plus one is two. OK, now uh, we can um, also compare the semantically related and the unrelated conditions against the correct control condition. So that's what I mentioned earlier, the, that comparison saying, um, does it actually matter if, so if we don't have repeated uh, letters, does it matter if the upcoming word that you see is actually the word that's going to be there later? It's the word that makes sense. Or is it fine if it's another word? Is it fine if it's another word or, is there, or could it even be a non-word? Is there, is there any difference in, um, in our gaze durations on the pre-boundary word uh, based on that? So here we would take the mean of tail and T-U-L-E. So we would sum up the, the two means and divide by zero. Um, and we would compare that to once, to the mean for once. So, um, so that gives us this, minus one times once plus zero times news plus zero times N-I-W-S because these are not uh, included in our comparison, plus one half times tail plus one half times T-U-L-E uh, and that should equal zero. That's our null hypothesis, right? Uh, and again, so that's how we get the values for our contrast. And then we have one more contrast and we can use that to test if there was actually a difference between the semantically related and the unrelated conditions. So does it matter if, um, well, we already, we already know from the means that most likely it doesn't. Um, ideally, you would want to, um, you would want to um, make these contrasts before you've even seen the means, right? Because they are your a priori um, hypotheses. They should reflect your hypotheses and you should make your hypotheses before you've seen the means. Okay, I got a very good question, which I, uh, which I uh, expected, uh, which I hoped that people would ask. Okay, so the plus and minus, are the plus and minus signs on the variables of the equation related to the effect of their coefficient? So, so I think what you're asking is, why am I um, say why am I uh, using plus one third here and minus one half when I could get the exact same contrast? I could write minus one third plus one half plus one half minus one third minus one third, right? Okay, so you can do it either way. You can do it either way as long as it sums up to zero. What I have started doing for myself because it makes my life easier, is that I, um, that I put in the signs depending on my expectations for the, um, for the difference. So, I mean, so for example, in the, second, in the second one, it doesn't really matter if we subtract uh, the mean of news from the mean of NIWS or the mean of NIWS from the mean of news, which would be what we get if we use positive one here and minus one here, a negative one here, right? Um, but um, what I what I usually do is I um, 
I set the contrasts up, I set the signs of the contrast up so that the coefficient um, in the model will be positive if uh, the result uh, corresponds to what I expect. So here, um, even though the, strictly the hypothesis that we're testing is two-tailed, right? Um, we, are not, we are not testing a directional hypothesis. I might have the suspicion that, um, well, if there is a difference, uh, so then I should probably, if there is a difference, and if I'm actually faster um, on the word news, if I have a copy of the same word to the right, um, then uh, maybe I will be even faster if I have an exact copy than if I do not have a copy. If I do not have exact, an exact copy, if the copy is a little bit different, because I have the I here instead of the E. So the way this is set up is now um, that what we're getting in the coefficient is the difference between NIW. So it's NIWS minus news, right? Because the minus one is here and not here. Um, so that means that if uh, the gaze durations in NIWS are a little bit larger or a little bit higher than in news, then I'm going to get a positive uh, estimate for the coefficient in the model because then NIWS minus news is going to be positive, right? And I do this for all of them. So, so again, I, I would here, I would expect um, that if you have this in the, if you have a copy in the paraphobia, if you have a copy to the right of where you're looking, then you're you might be a little bit faster. So, uh, so since that is my expectation, I, um, I set this to, uh, to be negative so that the, so that the sum that, uh, that this coefficient reflects is going to be the mean of these three minus the mean of these two, okay? So if the mean of these three, one's tail and T-U-L-E is uh, higher than the mean of mu's and N-I-W-S, then I'm going to get a positive coefficient. Um, so, and then by, if I consistently do that, um, for all of these. So here I would say, well, maybe, maybe you would be faster if the word that you, that you actually get, uh, if you see the word that you actually, that actually follows on the sentence uh, compared to seeing something different. Or here, maybe you're faster if you see something semantically related than uh, the unrelated condition. So then I can just, I can just look at uh, my model once it's fitted and I can see immediately uh, well, if all, the, if all the coefficients are positive, then all the effects are going into the direction that I expected. If one of them is negative, then I can tell, oh, this effect didn't go in the same direction that I expected. So either, so to sum it up, either way is fine. Either way you do it is fine. Um, it's up to you, but I like to set, to set it up so that if my, um, suspicions about the direction of an effect are confirmed, then uh, I get a positive value. If, they, if the dif effect goes in an unexpected direction, then I get a negative value, okay? All right, so let's take a look at how we define this. So here we go. I've just entered those same numbers here. Uh, one third minus one half minus one half, one third, one third. Um, so those are my four contrasts, right? It's just just like uh, here. Um, and uh, then, so I enter them each as one C, so as one um, vector basically, as one list of values. And then I bind them together uh, in columns using C bind. And again, this is, this is how I, uh, uh, this is how I um, prefer doing it. There's many other ways of doing it um, to get this same matrix, which is, which uh, is shown here, right? Okay. So now there is a there is a very important step that uh, that we can't miss uh, when we do this, um, and that step is we actually need to use the inverse of the, the transposed inverse of these contrasts. Now, um, if you're not familiar with uh, matrix algebra saying uh, what's the inverse and 
what's a transpose doesn't really tell you anything. Um, so since since I don't uh, yeah I don't want to make it too complex. Um, it's basically just uh, so basically well you can say every oh um, well yeah, let's say some some matrices can have an inverse. Uh, taking the inverse of a matrix is sort of a similar thing to solving uh, solving a set of equations. Okay, to, to make it to make it very very high level, simple. Um, what you do in um, when you fit uh, any kind of regression is essentially you you multiply a matrix. Uh, very, very, very roughly you multiply the the matrix of the of the data and uh, of the data with the inverse of itself. Um, don't worry, don't worry too much about it. But um, but basically, R just wants uh, the contrast matrix in this format instead of as its inverse, right? So so we just have to make sure that we do this. Because when I started as a PhD student, I didn't know uh, that this was necessary, and so um, I never, I never did this, and um, and so my contrasts didn't always test exactly what uh, they were supposed to test. Now I always used orthogonal contrasts, um, so it didn't. It didn't actually matter, but if you're using non-orthogonal contrasts, so like the ones that, like the treatment, well, treatment contrasts, it doesn't matter because those are defined in R. But if you made uh, contrasts of your own that are not orthogonal, then you could actually be testing differences that you didn't mean to test, and then it's of course important. So, so for me, um, my my contrasts when I when I use non-orthogonal contrasts. Um, my contrasts just didn't correspond to the means in the data. So I said, well, these contrasts can't be right. So I just used different contrasts until I got ones that reflected uh, the day, the means. And, and that was fine. So that's why I didn't have to retract some papers. Um, but this can be, so, so that's why I'm saying, make sure that you are uh, using the correct that you're using the contrast in the format that R expects. And make sure that you uh, that you assign the contrast like this. The ability of putting in your own contrast is really great, um, but you need to make sure that you are using them correctly. So, so basically, when you um, and yeah, and and again, it, if something like this happens to you, if you forget to do this. And then you realize that uh, that you, your contract, your results do not correspond to the means. Then you need to go back and figure out what went wrong. And this is one of the things that could have gone wrong. So in my case, um, since I only used orthogonal contrasts, um, it turns out that uh, that if you forget to do this for orthogonal contrasts. All you get is uh, a slightly strangely you get slightly strangely scaled contrast. So um, so you might get um, you might you might well the difference between condition means uh, that you get in your estimate might be uh, sort of just one half of the difference that you that you would expect, for example. Um, and and that, I mean that's fine because the t the t value and the p value those are still going to be the same, so it doesn't affect the interpretation. But if you do this for non-orthogonal contrasts, it would affect the interpretation, and that's and that's when you're making a mistake like that. That's when referring back to the data and saying this does not make sense if I look at the means protects you from uh, trusting your model and maybe sending uh, something to uh, to a journal that way where you're making conclusions based on contrasts that don't test the difference that you think you are testing. Okay, so just a, a cautionary tale. <laughs> uh, 
uh, on that. So you can see here, um, this is what you actually get this, um, when you do this. This that small, uh, just, um, just when, you do, when you're using this command, this uh, GINV, generalized inverse, um, that, that actually sometimes it introduces really, really small numbers um, due to rounding error. It doesn't matter for the contrast, but if we want to display them nicely, we can use this command that's zap small. So basically it just sets numbers that are very, very close to zero to zero. Okay, so that's why this looks uh, nicer. Um, so, oh yeah, so what you need to use the, the GINV, so the generalized inverse command, is you need to use uh, the package mass. So just make sure that you have it loaded and load it before, load it before tidyverse because you can see that uh, it has a, a function that has the same uh, name as a tidyverse function, as a dplyr function. Okay, um, so yeah, so, so just instead of assigning your new contrast directly here, assign the T is for the transpose of the matrix and then the transpose of the general inverse of the of your contrast, and that'll be fine. So this is what they then actually um, this is what they then actually look like. And you can see um, since these are orthogonal contrasts, um, which means that they're not correlated um, with each other. Um, all the all the uh, generalized inverse does is it it scales the uh, contrast differently, right? So, um, so it doesn't change what you are comparing. It just changes um, sort of the scaling. Okay. So let's fit the model with the new contrasts. Okay. So um, again, the command is exactly the same as before. We're just having different, uh, we're just having different contrasts associated with the preview factor now. We can get the summary again, just like before. And you can see everything, everything stays pretty much the same. Remel criterion is, is, I think is exactly the same. Scaled residuals are exactly the same. Random effects are exactly the same, but of course the fixed effect estimates change. So now we've got um, preview one. Um, Preview one is we have an estimate of 12 and that's significant. And then the other ones, we don't have uh, significant differences. Okay, so, and uh, what's, what's also interesting to notice because these, these contrasts are, um, these contrasts are orthogonal, you can see there, um, the correlations between the fixed effects are very close to zero. So that's another advantage of having um, orthogonal contrasts. Okay. So only the first contrast was significant. So that means we can only reject uh, the first null hypothesis. Uh, if we remember, what was the first null hypothesis? It was that the difference between um, the previews that were orthogonal uh, that were orthograph orthographically related to the currently fixated word and uh, those that weren't, that this difference uh, was zero. That's the null hypothesis that we tested and that's the null hypothesis that we can reject. So there's a difference. If we want to look at the direction, um, I mean, look at, uh, look at this, it's, it's positive. So um, because I've thought about where, which signs are going, I'm going to use, I could say, okay, this goes into the direction that I expect, which is that uh, the, orthog the orthographically related uh, previews actually make fixation times or gaze durations on the preboundary word shorter. Okay, because this is the way I've signed, I've, I've set it up, and all the other, um, 
all the other uh, comparisons, all the other differences are also, uh, they're all positive. They're all going into the direction that I've expected, but they are not significant. They are, they, uh, they are really, really tiny T values, really, really high P values, right? Um, so um, for the second one, if you remember that the question, is there a difference between the orthographically related preview that is an exact match with the upcoming words or news uh, compared to the uh, preview that is almost a match, N-I-W-S. Um, and what we can say here is uh, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So at least this, uh, this experiment did not provide evidence uh, for this hypothesis, right? It did not corroborate this hypothesis. Okay, the third, the third one is, was, is there a difference between the preview of the actual upcoming word and previews that are different from the upcoming word and that are not identical, uh, sorry, that are not repeated, that are not identical to the upcome, to the, to the word that you're actually looking at, sorry that are neither identical to the upcoming word nor to the word that you're currently looking at. And again, we, we do not find evidence. We do not corroborate the, the hypothesis that this is the case because we didn't find a significant effect. Um, then contrast, then the fourth contrast was um, whether there was a difference between the uh, semantically related preview and the completely unrelated and non-word preview. And again, there's no evidence uh, from this experiment that this is the case. We do not corroborate the hypothesis that this is the case. Okay, so ideally, um, when you are setting up your experiment, when you are setting up and, and thinking about your analysis and thinking about your, um, your conditions, um, that's when you should uh, already think about your contrasts and you should, and ideally each of your contrasts, each of your comparisons should reflect one of the hypotheses you want to test. So each of the, each of these should test uh, a hypothesis, should test a different hypothesis, right? Um, and I mean, that is the most transparent way of doing an analysis. You have your hypothesis in the introduction, you know, all your hypotheses in the introduction section, and then one contrast each corresponds to each of the hypotheses. And then um, that also makes it so much easier to interpret, right? Okay. So next, Next topic that I wanted to address here is another one that, that you really need to think about when you, uh, when you want to use dynamics models, which is which random effects should I include? So um, remember that a linear mix model is fitted using maximum likelihood or uh, restricted maximum likelihood, um, which involves essentially the computer trying to find the best solution for the model because the model is always, um, fitting a model always involves finding a solution to sort of a system of equations, you could say, right? Um, for least squares, uh, so for the standard multiple regression and ANOVA, um, finding the solution, uh, I mean, there's a mathematical solution. You can, you can simplify the solution. You can, you can uh, just solve, you can use some formulas to, uh, to find your, the solution for your equations. And there's always a clear mathematical, it's also called closed form solution. So in a maximum likelihood model, uh, so a model that you fit with maximum likelihood, it's too complex to be um, fitted like that, or you could say it doesn't have a closed form solution. So uh, essentially you solve it by um, iteratively trying different uh, possible uh, values for the 
for the different parameters of the model, like the uh, like your model estimate, like the estimates or the variance estimates, right? Um, you um, you try to you try different values, and uh, iteratively you get closer and closer to the best solution. Okay. Now, how do you know that you've arrived at the best solution? Well, you've arrived at you you have probably arrived at the best solution if you just keep going, getting closer and closer, and after a while um, the solution doesn't change that much anymore uh, with each step. So that's what's called convergence. So convergence means that uh, the algorithm, it's called a nonlinear optimizer, the algorithm that's used. And it's, it is much smarter than just trying different uh, numbers, right? It is, um, it, it is uh, much more efficient than, than randomly trying different numbers, but it's still essentially trying different numbers. It's just a, just a smart and efficient way of trying different numbers. Okay, so at some point, uh, when you're getting closer to the best solution, um, you will keep getting the same estimates again and again and again. Um, and that's, how, that's when you know that, uh, your optimizer has converged on to the best solution. Okay, so um, and different things can happen um, because this is not this is there is there is not one well there is probably one best solution but uh, the way to find it is not to sort to just uh, use mathematics like normal mathematics so. Uh, because that is the case. So first of all, fitting the model can take a while because the more iterations it takes to get to convergence, the longer it takes to fit the model on your computer. Um, and then um, it can also fail to converge. So it could be that after a set number of iterations, so usually it does, uh, I think, 10,000 iterations, um, after a set number of iterations, uh, the model does not find um, a solution. So then, uh, then uh, it just gives up. So it, it will tell you that you have had a convergence failure. Okay, or it can, um, it can come up with a solution. So it can converge on the solution, but the solution has a problem. So for example, uh, it might converge on a solution where two of the parameters are, where, or where one of the parameter is, uh, has a variance of zero or uh, where two of the uh, parameters are perfectly, or two of the variances are perfectly correlated, something like that. Um, so that is also a type of convergence failure. Um, if you have a convergence failure in your model, you can't use any of the estimates that come from the model because you don't know. Uh, you don't know how far away this uh, uh, this solution that you're getting. Well, it's not really a solution. The, these values that you're getting are from the actual correct solution. So if if the model just stopped trying um, after ten thousand iterations then it could be that you are on a good solution and then that you are close to the solution. Um, or it could be that you're very far away. So you have no way of knowing. Okay, and the same when you have something like a sing, it's called a singular convergence. So when you have a convergence that is deficient in some ways, um, then you also don't know if, uh, if the fixed effects, even if they look reasonable, you don't know if they in in what way they are affected by the deficiencies in the solution, so you can't you can't use that. Okay, so the the issue is that um, model convergence. So it doesn't it doesn't sort of fail randomly. It fails. Uh, there are certain models that are much harder to fit than other ones, and models that are particularly hard to fit um, are ones with random effects for which 
there is uh, that explain or that explain very little variance. Okay, so for example, um, in in my data, if the effect of preview does not change that much depending on my experimental item. So of all items show roughly the same effect of preview. Um, but I still include random slopes for preview by item in my linear mixed model. That might cause a convergence failure because there simply isn't a good solution. Right? The, 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 or, well, all the good, the good solution would mean that, um, that actually the, uh, the variance explained by the random slopes is very close to zero, but the nonlinear optimizer is not good at finding that kind of a, of a solution. Okay, um, going back, I had just had the question, could I explain the difference between a random intercept only model and one with random slopes? Yes, this is, a, this is again a very good question um, to, to remind you what, what that different is, difference is. So random intercepts means that basically uh, for each participant, um, I can get an intercept that is slightly higher or slightly lower. And it's conceptually, it's the same thing than, so than the average intercept for everyone. Um, so you have one intercept for everyone, and then uh, you have a subject intercept that can be a little bit higher or a little bit lower than, um, than the average intercept, right? Um, the thing is that, um, that, well, random, so this random intercept, it's basically, like a main effect. Conceptually, it's just like a main effect of, for example, subject or item. So if my subject intercept is a little bit higher than the um, overall intercept, that means that this subject is on average a little bit slower than uh, the average subject, right? If I have a subject intercept that's lower than the overall intercept, then that means that I have a subject that's overall across all of the conditions a little bit faster, right? Uh, and same thing with items. I could have items that are processed a little bit faster and items that are processed a little bit slower than other items, right? So, uh, so that is basically, it is basically an intercept, random intercept is basically like a main effect, right? So it's an effect that is across all of the, um, experimental conditions independent from any of the variables that are included in the model. Okay. Now, random slopes means that uh, I don't only, I mean, usually you, you have random intercepts uh, anyway. Uh, usually if you have random slopes, you're also going to have random intercepts. So if I have random slopes, that means that not only can there be sort of a main effect difference between different subjects, but you can also have um, the effect, the size of the effect. So for example, the size of my effect of the preview manipulation can differ depending on the subject or the, the participant. So maybe some people are more sensitive to having du duplicated words um, in the paraphobia than other subjects, right? It could also be that some that for some items, so where items are sentences, so so maybe there are some target words and post-target words, some combinations of target words and post-target words that just happen to be in some of my sentences that generate a much stronger effect than others, right? So um, so this would be uh, conceptually the same thing as an interaction. Right. This would be the conceptually. It would be very similar to to saying there's an interaction of the effect of subject, for example, and the effect of preview. So that is that is the difference. And of course, uh, the the sort of main effect. So the uh, the random intercepts. Uh, those usually capture a lot more variance, unless you have a a very very special case. Like like usually. Um, in most cases, the main effects are stronger uh, than the interactions, right? Um, not always, because you could have some cases where you have fairly weak main effects or marginal effects, um, but strong interactions, right? 
but most of the time the interactions are uh, smaller and harder to detect than the main effect. And it's the same thing with uh, random intercepts and random slopes. Usually the random slopes are going to explain less variance than the random intercepts. Now you could have a case where for some reason your experimental effect differs a lot by participants. Um, so it's not impossible. It is definitely not impossible um, where you would have then a strong, uh, a strong where you have a, would have a strong effect, basically a strong interaction. It's not really an interaction between participant and your effect. A strong, so you would have um, random slopes that explain a lot of variance. So uh, it's possible, but no, in in uh, our research, usually you don't you don't see it. Okay, so um, so that so that is the difference. So and and because there's usually less variance captured by the random slopes, um, it is usually harder to fit a model that has uh, random slopes. So um, so just because the the algorithm. Nonlinear optimizer is really bad at um, at estimating variances that are very very small. Okay. All right. So on the other hand, the problem is that in those cases where the random slopes actually matter, uh, they can affect the interpretation of the result. So um, let's say, for example. Um, you have an effect that you just see in uh, in one particular uh, participant, or you just see in a handful of participants. Um, I mean that would be interesting in itself, right? But uh, but for the for the overall interpretation, um, you would you would want to be able to generalize your effect to everyone. So let's say for some reason you have you just have more observations uh, from that one participant uh, that one participant that drives the effect compared to uh, the other participants that don't have the effect now of course this is an extreme example because those would be very weird research data but but hey it's it's not impossible right um, so in that case it could be that you are interpreting something as a fixed effect so that you're interpreting something that an effect that is common to all participants when it is actually only um, affecting one participant. This is an extreme case or, or a handful of participants, right? Um, so in that case, uh, you really would want to have the random intercepts um, in your model, right? Uh, sorry, you would, you would want to have the random slope inside in in your model you would have to include it okay so the recommendation as to what random effects to use um, is at, and this comes from a paper by Bauer, Levy, uh, Shapers and Tilly from 2013 that's uh, called random effect structure for confirmatory hypothesis testing keep it maximal um, so I still I still follow their recommendation which is essentially use the maximum random effect structure that uh, that converges. Okay, uh, singular singular fits. Okay, for that. Uh, so I had a question about singular fits. Well, for for that we would have to go into. Um, so it's basically a singular fit means that the the model matrix is singular. Um, for that we would have to we would have to go into. Uh, what it means to have a singular matrix. Essentially, I think I think it it is enough to say um, that it is a, a problematic fit. That it is a fit that um, where some of the uh, where essentially you have uh, improper values for some of the parameters, and uh, and because of that you shouldn't use it. You can. I mean, if in practice you don't have to make a difference between singular fits and other convergence failures, uh, it's just usually the sing you get the singular fit faster than a, than like a regular convergence failure, 
because uh, you actually have a convergence. It just converges um, on sort of an extreme. You could you could also say it it, it converges uh, in the in the if you imagine the um, the all the possibilities of parameters a sort of a, a parameter space. It it converges uh, at sort of a, on a very extreme part of the parameter space where where it, where it shouldn't really be. Maybe maybe that that sort of helps. Okay. So um, all right. So um, so we want to include um, as many random effects as makes sense. Of course, it doesn't make sense to to include random effects that can't exist. So uh, so for example, I uh, I once uh, tried to fit a model with a frequency manipulation with a word. So I had an experiment with a word frequency manipulation. Um, and uh, no, actually, it wasn't a word frequency manipulation. I just included uh, the word frequency of each word in a sentence. OK, so then uh, and then um, because it was very late and uh, and I wasn't really thinking about what I was doing, I thought, oh, maybe I should maybe I should just include. Uh, so I so I had a random effect for words, which was essentially which was kept uh, all the variants, uh, all the the variants. So random, yeah, random effect for words, which is basically capturing all the variants that wasn't captured by a fixed effect about different words, right? So I thought. Oh, maybe maybe I should just put in order to keep things maximal. I should just put where, uh, in a random slope of uh, word frequency by words. Okay, and then I uh, then I was surprised when uh, the model didn't converge. Uh, of course, then then when I when I looked at it the next day, it, I realized uh, this model uh, well it could never converge. Uh, why not? Because what I was trying to do was I was essentially trying to get the model to estimate an interaction between the the effect of word frequency and different words. So the effect of word frequency is, of course, the difference essentially between a low frequency word and a high frequency word, right? Um, so I tried to estimate. Um, for each word, what would what would be uh, the difference of having a high frequency word compared to a low frequency word, right? So maybe I, maybe I'm still not uh, not making it clear that this doesn't make any sense. So essentially, I I I wanted to estimate the effect of what. How different would uh, would fixation times on this word be if this if we had a high frequency version of the word versus a low frequency version of the word? Now, of course, you know that word frequency is uh, a property of the word, so you can't have a high frequency version of a word and a low frequency version of a word. The word has one particular word frequency value. You can't have uh, you can't observe the word as a low frequency word and as a high frequency word, at least not in the experiment. I mean, at least not in the experiment that I was doing. I just had one word frequency value. So what I asked the model to do was uh, literally impossible. I asked it to estimate an effect for which there was absolutely no data. And of course, it failed to converge because, um, well, what a um, what a um, yeah well what a standard Lee, uh, Lee squares model does when you give it a impossible data. So um, when you give it, for example, two predictors that are perfectly correlated, well, it, you just can't fit the model because uh, your equations don't work out. But with the uh, maximum likelihood way of fitting the model, um, you uh, you notice that. You have a problem with the model that you are asking you, that you're fitting um, when when you get uh, the convergence error, 
And of course, the problem is, the problem is also that, uh, well, the model, if you, if you put in something unreasonable, so another, another thing would be, um, let's say you had, uh, you had, uh, I don't know, uh, literacy tests for, for, for participants. And you try to, um, you try to estimate a random slope for literacy scores by participants, right? So that would be saying that, oh, give me, give me the effect of, uh, of having different literacy scores, um, that particular effect for this one participant. So as if you could observe a version of the participant who has a low literacy score and a version of the participant who has a high literacy score and then compare those. I mean, usually people only have one score, right? So there is just nothing in the data that the model could use to, um, to estimate what you're asking it to do. So if you're asking the model to do the impossible, it will definitely not converge. But the problem is, of course, that it also converges when you ask it uh, to do perfectly reasonable things, right? So it is, um, there is a little bit of, uh, uh, of well, I don't know if, if it's chance, but there's a little bit of sort of luck involved. Can can is your data is it going to work with your data set? Are you going to be able to get uh, to be able to estimate random slopes? So, yeah. So the idea of keeping it maximal is uh, is basically um, try to fit the the uh, model with the most general random effect structure that makes sense. Okay. So, of course, don't try to fit things that don't make sense, like I did uh, when I tried to uh, estimate different slopes for word frequency over words. That's never going to work. But try to estimate a model that's as general as possible, that allows as many random slopes as makes sense. So here, um, for example, what I'm trying to do is I am, so the preview manipulation is both in this experiment, it's both within subjects and within items. So all subjects, all participants see um, sentences in all the preview, in all the five preview conditions, right? And all the sentences are also can be seen in all the five preview conditions, right? So the preview manipulation is within subjects and it is within items. So in theory, it makes sense that you could have a random slope of preview by subject and a random slope of preview by item. Now I'm trying to fit this model and it's going, it uh, takes a very long time. And then um, what you get is, um, is something like this. So it just says, uh, it gives you things like unable to evaluate scaled gradient, model failed to convert, degenerate Hessian with one negative eigenvalues, model failed to converge. So this basically means that you, your model has, uh, well, you, the algorithm has not been able to produce a good model matrix. You don't have to worry about exactly uh, what it means to have a degenerate Hessian matrix. Um, but it just means that um, the model was not able to estimate all the parameters. Okay. So again, you can get a summary from this model and we're going to get it on the next page to take a look at, uh, at the random effect, but you can't really interpret anything uh, from that model. You can't make any conclusion you can't have any conclusions. It can, it can maybe give you some idea of what you could do next, but it, you can't make, you can't conclude anything because you don't know how far away the solution that you got is from an actual good solution. You only know that you have a good solution um, when you get convergence, okay? So now, uh, so now the keep it maximal strategy would be well, I've tried the maximal model. It didn't converge. Uh, now I should take uh, one of the random effects out uh, and see if it will converge. And so which one should you take out? Um, 
usually um, I find that there is less random variance in items than in subjects, but your data may vary. And in fact, uh, in this case, it's, that is not the case. Um, so you can take a look at the random effects on the model summary. Uh, so if the variance is very low or if effects are highly correlated, that probably means that there isn't enough data to estimate this effect. And again, usually interactions are harder to estimate than main effects. And an interaction, uh, the random slope for an interaction is basically an interaction of an interaction. So that's going to be even harder to estimate because usually you also don't have that much data. Okay, so let's take a look at the summary. So um, these days, um, actually the, uh, so, and with Elmer test, uh, it's good about putting a warning underneath the summary that you should not use this, right? So it says convergence code zero, unable to evaluate scale gradient, model failed to converge. So, so it actually, here you can see it, it convergence code zero, okay. So it actually converged on something, but what it converged onto was not um, a useful uh, model matrix, okay. Um, so you can see you can, you have fixed effects here and you have a, a, a result that looks like it's significant and so on, but you can actually interpret this. I mean, usually the fixed effects will, that you get for, for a model without convergence are going to be fairly similar to the ones that you get for a model with convergence, but you can't rely on that, okay? So, so don't, uh, don't even look at them basically. Okay, so now uh, we can look at the random effects and we can maybe see a little bit where the problem comes from. So we're, we're looking at, um, we might be looking at, we're looking at uh, the variance here for the different contrasts. And we see here that um, there's very little variance that's actually, um, captured by the random slope of uh, preview. So the first contrast and the second contrast um, by subject, okay? And what's also, what's also interesting is we have a very high correlation here. Um, so that would be the correlation uh, of uh, preview three with uh, preview two. Right, so uh, 0.93. So that points to um, that points to this. Uh, there probably not being enough variance to fit the the random slope of preview by subject. So so this is actually surprising to me because usually it's the item random effects that that cause or the item random slopes that cause problems. But in this case, uh, well, it looks like the bigger problem is with the subject random slope doesn't mean that uh, that there couldn't also be a problem with item because you have these are also not such high variances right and here you have the first uh, the first and the say no this is the first um, was this oh no preview two correlated with the intercept uh, you have a you have a fairly high correlation oh yeah and this is preview three correlated with preview one actually too this is correlation with the intercepts, yeah. Um, so again, this could be this could be a problem. We don't really know until until we try. Okay, so let's uh, so let's go and try. So let's because because it seems like we had the least variance uh, for the random slopes by subject. Let's take them out. Um, what happens is unfortunately so we leave the we leave the random slopes for item in what happens is unfortunately that now we get a singular uh, fit which also doesn't work so again uh, negative eigenvalue basically means that um, some of your parameters are uh, perfectly correlated or just uh, they don't yeah they don't it it failed to estimate at least one parameter um, so in this case, we don't even have to look back at the model um, because there's only one random slope left, right? Uh, which is the one for uh, preview. And so we, we have to remove that one as well. So it turns out that the best uh, model is the one that just has two, the two random intercepts and that's it. And in this case, there's nothing really you can do about it, that you can do about it, right? 
and you can say that you went through this process. So you can say something like, we report a model with random intercepts for subjects and items, more general models with random slopes for preview by subject or preview by item or both, fail to converge. Hence, the reported model is the one with the maximum random effect structure that was possible to fit. Something like that, and that is perfectly fine. People will, people will accept that. It, it shows that you have worried about, you have worried, you have, you have tried to get the maximum or the maximal random effect structure, but it just wasn't possible with the data uh, that you were using. And this way, you also can motivate why you only have random intercepts, even though based on your design, in theory, um, it's not impossible to have uh, to have random slopes uh, because preview was both within subject and within item. Okay, and then um, you would report the model, uh, for example, for the significant effect. So I'm so I'm going back to I'm going back to the the model with the new contrast now, right? Uh, this one here. Mm. Now you would just um, Report it um, like you would um, any model, any t test from a regression model. So um, you would say something like the contrast comparing the previews that were orthographically related to the pre boundary word, for example, news and NIWS, to those preview that were not orthographically related, for example, the control preview once, um, then the uh, the semantically related preview tail and the unrelated preview T-U-L-E uh, reached significance. And then uh, in parentheses, you put um, the coefficient estimate B, so 12.02, the standard error 2.82. Uh, for the T-value, if you want, you can uh, put in parentheses the degrees of freedom so that it's clearer for people what the uh, 4.25, um, so what what T distribution the 4.25 is uh, is coming from, right, or is tested against. And then um, here I just have P smaller than 0 0.01. Uh, if you look at the actual model fit, it's uh, 2.16 E minus 5. So E minus 5 means that you move the, um, the dot here five places, five digits to the left. So um, so it's basically, I think it's uh, 0 0.00000216, right? Um, that's, not, uh, that's not actually that useful to report. Uh, so in that case, you just say uh, P smaller than 0 0.01. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's the way you could do that. Okay, and finally, just just a quick thing to mention before we stop, because I want to have some time for questions. Uh, one very easy way to uh, so so looking at the uh, in that model that we had, right? Uh, looking at the scaled residuals, we could tell that they have a long tail to the right, so they are skewed to the right, right? The the residuals, the maximum residual is a lot further to the right uh, than the minimum residual is to the left. Okay. So, and that, of course, the assumption uh, for a linear mixed model is that the errors, so that the residuals are actually normally distributed, right? Because otherwise, using uh, the T distribution or the F distribution uh, for your tests doesn't make any sense. Um, so one way to get the, um, so this is not necessarily the best way, but it's the easiest way to get your data closer to normality, uh, would be to use, uh, the logarithm. Um, so instead of fitting, um, instead of using, uh, the raw fixation time, or raw gaze duration as your dependent variable, you transform your gaze duration into log gaze duration. Um, 
so usually you use the natural logarithm with phase e, but it doesn't really matter which one you use. Uh, mainly, um, mainly what you um, what you do is what well what you do by um, using a log transformation is that you pull all you pull the extreme values closer together. And uh, the result of that is that you usually get a distribution that is at least somewhat closer to a normal distribution. Okay. Uh, there are some uh, there are some important problems with using log transformations. So you can't log transform negative values or zero values. So you would have to remove them or, con or transform them before doing the log transformation. So with gaze duration, it's not really a problem because you don't have zero gaze duration, but if, gaze duration. But if you had a, a dependent variable that included zeros, one way to deal with that problem would be to add a small value, a small constant value to all uh, of your uh, observations, uh, just so you can do the log transformation, okay? And Another thing is that actually, uh, and a more important problem is that actually using this log transformation changes the interpretation of your coefficients. Because um, a regression equation in without a log transformation is additive, right? You, uh, you say, okay, so, um, so it's, the, it's the intercept plus, um, plus my coefficient times uh, my observation, right? But um, if I have this linear relationship in log space, that means that if I transform this back into a raw space, which is, uh, which is what I usually want to interpret it, it means that the relationship is actually um, multiplicative. So instead of saying that um, my, um, coefficient reflects what I multi what I um, add to basically what I add to the intercept or subtract from the intercept. Now it is what I multiply the intercept by or what I divide the intercept by. Okay, so that so instead of saying um, instead of saying okay um, my if in for example in the preview condition I um, I observe fixation times that are, I don't know, 12 milliseconds lower in this preview condition than in the control condition. I would say something like in the uh, in this pre in the repeat condition, I observe uh, fixation times that are, for example, 5% lower because that's multiplicative. Okay, so here's just an example. Um, I don't know why I called it that way. That's a, that's a typo. It should just be my new contrast, the log, the log version. So here, the nice thing about the log transformation is that you can apply it very uh, easily. You just write log parentheses, then your dependent variable, uh, and you put that uh, parenthesis closed, and you put that to the left of the tilde here. Okay, and you can see. So now everything is in log space. So of course, uh, the Ramel criterion is different. The residuals are different, although you can see it's still skewed to the right because the maximum um, the maximum residual is four, uh, and the minimum is minus three. So it's still a little bit further away, but the difference is a lot smaller than before, where we had minus two and and plus six, right? So so it is the right skew has gone oops has gone away a little bit. Okay, so. Um, so now, of course, um, everything is in log space, and I have to interpret everything in log space. In this case, it doesn't make a huge difference for the uh, conclusion because it still says that there is a significant difference uh, between the the previews where we have an orthographic, uh, where, well, where we have uh, orthographic information repeated in the paraphobia, and those previews where we don't. And we don't have a significant difference anywhere else, um, but you can see how this is um, a bit harder to interpret now. 
Okay, and everything else still stays the same. All right, so I wanted to have time for questions. I hope that um, I have, uh, this time I have found uh, a speed and an amount of information that was uh, easier to digest uh, for this group. Um, and uh, yes, okay, we have the first, the first question. So um, if you were trying to fit a linear mixed model with multiple predictors and then with multiple random slopes for each variable. So, so essentially you have multiple predictors that are, um, that are manipulated uh, within subjects, within items, for example. Um, would there be any difference in the way you approach the model after it fails to converge? Um, I would always look at, again, I would always look at um, the, um, the estimates of the random effect. And I would try to see, now, of course, you can only, you can only remove all of the contrasts for, for preview as random slopes or none of them. So here, I would just look at um, which one of them uh, explains the least variance. Right, so that's clearly the uh, the slope by subject here. Um, and if I had if I had more than one effect, then I would look at those. So which 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 one of them explains the least variance? And I would and and maybe also has the highest correlations with other um, with other uh, random slopes. Um, and I would take that out first. And then I would try again and see does it converge. And if it still doesn't converge, then I would then I would look again and see which one is now the one that um, that is associated with the least uh, random variance. And I would take out um, and I would take out that. And I would keep doing that until I finally got to uh, a model that converges. And usually, a model with random with just the random intercept does converge. Um, I've seen some very, very rare, in very rare cases I've seen when I've used what we didn't get to uh, this uh, in this um, class, when I, when I had logistic linear mixed models uh, where, where it only converged if I had a random intercept for subjects, but it didn't if I also added the random intercept for items. But that was very, that is very unusual. Usually um, the one with the model with just random intercepts um, converges and converges very quickly. And so I would just, um, I would just take the, um, the random effects variance of the failed models uh, sort of as a guide as to which effect I would, uh, which random slope I would remove uh, next and keep doing that until I have a model that works. That's what I would essentially do. Does that answer the question? Okay, great, thank you. And, and yeah, usually it's the interactions that capture the least variance. So, um, Usually, I would remove those first, but not always. It depends on. Um, it really depends on your data. Okay. Any more questions? Well, people are. Um, I mean, I felt just from just from questions that I got during. Uh, during the presentation, while I was talking, I felt that people were following a little bit more uh, this time. I, I do realize that last time there was it was a lot of content uh, very quickly to get you sort of to the point um, uh, where you could where I well to give you all the background information that that I thought you needed. So so I hope that today was um, a little bit easier, maybe to digest, and a little bit easier to get. And then, and now, if you if you go back and and now you watch the video uh, from the last time, 
I think um, you might actually uh, be able to get a little bit more out of it when I when I talk about the contrast, for example, when I talk about um, how to get the model estimates and where I get and how to how to calculate what the model is uh, is actually predicting and things like that and we where we talk about um, the, the background of everything. Okay. Um, any more questions? Anything? I mean, I um, if you have uh, if you still uh, if you still come up with questions uh, afterwards, um, I am happy for you to email me. You depending on how busy I am, you you might not get an answer uh, right away, but I will try to I will try to answer you and I um, and of course, if you if the, the more concrete your question is, the the better it is, uh, the easier it is for me to help you. So I probably won't be able to um, sort of uh, look over your entire analysis for you. But if you have a particular question, like, am, am I doing this right? Um, am I uh, am I doing this properly? Then uh, yeah. Good. So um, yeah. So um, so yeah. And if if your internet cut out, uh, don't worry. This is uh, is being recorded, and you can watch it all later. Okay. Um, yes. The problems uh, in using log transformation. So um, in the so there are practical problems, which is that there are simply some values that you can't. Uh, transform into uh, into log like zero and minus one. Mm. So there you're just going to you will just you would just um, in that case you would just end up with missing values, right? Um, and that's not what you want to do. So uh, so for that, those are things that you can um, you can solve. For example, by just making sure that you don't have zero values in your data, right? So, um, and and for example, if so, if your zero is actually meaningful, you could just uh, you could just add a very small value to it, like 0.005 or something like that, and that would enable you to transfer to try to um, to actually transform the data into log. Then the issue with um, the other issue with log transformations is that um, it changes how you interpret um, the coefficients. Because in if you do a regression in raw space, the coefficients are interpreted as additive, so intercept plus something. In law, if you uh, use a log model and then go back into raw space, which you usually want to, because you want to interpret your things in a, a I mean, I don't have a lot of intuitions about log gaze duration. I, it's much easier for me to understand uh, gaze duration than log gaze duration, right? Um, so when you go back into raw space, uh, so from log gaze duration, you transform it back into, um, Gaze duration, then you you realize that the um, that the relationship between um, your coefficients uh, is now multiplicative. So your coefficient, instead of saying, um, for example, if we are in this condition, uh, so so these kind of, the mean of these conditions is twelve milliseconds less than the mean of this con these conditions. It now says. The mean of this condition is, let's say, five percent less than the mean of these conditions, right? So it, it is just just important to um, to keep that in mind that the relationships are now multiplicative. And there are some people who say, well, we can't really we we will always try to interpret these multiplicative uh, relationships as additive, and that's why we shouldn't even use log transformation. And there are there are um, alternatives. Um, that we didn't that we didn't get to, but for example, if you um, 
if you used um, if you actually used uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo method. So instead of estimating your linear dynamics model using uh, maximum likelihood and uh, and uh, maximum likelihood, yeah, maximum likelihood or restricted maximum likelihood and a nonlinear optimizer, you can also now fit, uh, you can also now um, basically Come up with so um, come up with the um, so do a do a Bayesian analysis and come up with the best uh, well with with essentially your belief about your subjective belief about the model parameters um, given the data and that uh, so that would be a um, uh, Bayesian approach. You can still use. Uh, you can still have a have the structure of a linear mixed model. So if you do that, you can just. Um, uh, so if you're using um, Markov chain Monte Carlo and you're using uh, basically a sampler, so where you we basically sample from the posterior distribution, and this this only may mean is only meaningful to you if you if you know about Bayesian statistics, right? In that case, you can just say, um, well, I assume that my errors are not uh, are not um, normally distributed, but for example, instead follow an X Gaussian distribution. So where we have a combination of a normal distribution and a Gaussian distribution. And that might, uh, so you're no longer, you're no longer, um, you're no longer bound to having to using a normal distribution. So, uh, so in that case, that could help as well, and it wouldn't have the same the same problem in interpretation. Okay. Um, next question. So, could you take out items that are deviating the results and run an LMM uh, without these items, or should uh, the variance be explained by using item as a random effect only. Um, you don't usually you don't usually know which uh, you, well you don't know what about what it is about your items that are uh, deviating your results, right? You I mean, and also I think uh, you should uh, you should be very careful with excluding bits of data, excluding data elements. I mean, if you have if you have an item that was clearly problematic. So the most, uh, the most common uh, thing would be um, after your experiment, you discovered that there was a typo in, in your item. It was just misspelled on the screen. So that's a good reason to exclude it because now your item is no longer a, a, a sample. It's no longer a proper, uh, Representative of the population of all items that you wanted to uh, test. So clearly, um, throwing that item that was misspelled in with all the other items is not going to help you, right? Is that's that's not uh, that's that's going to be problematic. So it's fine to exclude that. Also, let's say you have a you have a word that a lot of participants tell you afterwards that they didn't know what the word meant. Right, they 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 were not familiar with that word. In that case, also, um, you would probably want to take out that item because you have an external reason why uh, this item was not a good item, was not an item that you actually wanted to use. So in that case, it's fine to exclude item. I would not exclude items um, actually because of what came out in in your analysis because that's that's a dangerous thing excluding. Um, Excluding based on your analysis, because there you can then you can very easily get to into this mindset where oh I um, I will just exclude one more item until I get the result that I want. I mean usually you don't think like that, but um, but I think you should never do any data exclusion based on the analysis, the confirmatory analysis that you actually want to do. So, so even if you um, 
if you think that this is an item that causes your model to not converge, I, I think that unless you have a, a good external reason to exclude that item, it would be hard to justify it, right? Okay, now, of course, if you have an item, if you have one item that has uh, extremely long fixation times, um, then that is probably an outlier and it's probably not going to be, um, it's not going, again, you should probably exclude it because it's probably not, uh, not a good representative of, uh, of what you wanted to actually, of the items you actually wanted to include. And just and also like that, if, if a participant uh, spends, for example, uh, five seconds looking at one word, then probably what they were doing is not a good representative of the thing that you were trying to study. But those are very obvious external reasons of why you should, should exclude data. Um, and, and yes, so like Ronaldo says, um, it's very easy to get into thing to come into p hacking, hypothesizing after results are known, and and I mean, hypothesizing about which item caused your your model to not converge is is sort of it's it might be a, a, a better intention version of hypothesizing after the results are known, right? But it it could still be potentially dangerous. It could endanger. Uh, your conclusion is it could lead you to not making valid conclusions. So, so yes, so if you exclude anything, uh, any elements of your data, uh, you should have a very good and clear reason. So it should be, uh, you should also document it, of course, when you write up the study, you should say, um, this item was excluded because of experimental error. And that is fine, it happens. Uh, experimental error, there was a typo in this item. That's fine. Right. And but anything you do, uh, you have to be able to justify it. Right. Any any exclusions, anything you have to be able to justify it. OK, so I think uh, we are at the end of it. I'm uh, I'm wondering, um, Ronaldo or Guillermo, would you would you like to say anything at the end of this or um, who or should I? Say some words at the end, um, just so we can uh, we can close um, we can close this uh, this very nice uh, lecture series. Uh, hello, guys. Hi, Bernhard. Uh, I'll just say a few words then, uh, so we can uh, close this eight week session. Right? It has been uh, a long journey, so I'll just say. A few words, and I want uh, first to thank uh, Guilherme and Bernhard for uh, helping organize the course, and uh, thank uh, Bernhard for conducting these two uh, past weeks, last week and today. Uh, I need to thank uh, Pamela for uh, having the initial idea of organizing uh, the course, and uh, yes, and 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 congratulate everybody who's been uh, following along for eight weeks, right? It's not easy to be uh, online or even watching the videos lady, uh, later on YouTube, right? For eight weeks, three hour videos every week, a lot of material for those who had uh, very little knowledge or no knowledge at all of these models. It's, it's a lot to take in, but uh, thankfully we've, we've made material, materials available, right? So you guys can always go back to YouTube and rewatch the videos, pause, uh, explore the materials, right? And uh, we really hope that um, uh, having these materials available online uh, can help you guys, right? Uh, our intention is, of course, to help uh, the field of linguistics uh, and, and in this case, particularly here in Brazil, to help the field uh, develop in terms of uh, quantitative analysis of uh, linguistic data, right? So I'm, I'm very uh, happy with uh, the result of the course and having so many people uh, participating and uh, joining the course. So uh, hope to see you guys around online or 
in events when we can uh, uh, meet face to face again. Okay, so thank you very much, Bernard. If you if you want to say final words, you can uh, uh, close the session with your final words. Okay. 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 Yes. So I I just want to say I'm um, I'm very impressed. There are still at the end of the course. There are still 81 people after all of these hours. I'm I'm very proud of that. I'm also very proud of you for um, for staying so long despite this these two sessions probably being the the hardest to to follow uh, on the course i think you're going to have i mean i think you many of you probably will have to go back and revisit the video so we're going to put put up this video um as soon as we can download it from zoom and um and get to that and and we'll have the materials there so you can always go back um watch things slowly slow things down put the video on pause take a break think about uh what you listen to right uh do things look at um look at my files look at the rmd files if you look at at the files that i use to make the presentations you can also learn a lot about how to use our markdown to make your own presentation so give that give that a try too see if you what you can learn from uh from my uh, from my materials that I'm giving you, and you can run all of the R codes in the slides. So you can always um, you can always go um, go there and and do that. So uh, so yes. So I really hope that uh, you got a lot out of it. I hope you will get a lot out of this in the future as you go back and you revisit and. Just to finish it, just to finish it up, I I would just like to say as it, it's always a privilege to uh, teach great students to work together with great people to um, to do something like Ronaldo said to move a field forward and uh, and this has been this has been a real privilege. This has been a lot of fun to do as well. So thank you very much and. Uh, and yes, I hope to see you around soon as well. Who knows? Who knows where and what course or in Brazil or wherever else. But uh, but yeah, if, if there are conferences in the future and you see me, uh, definitely say hi. All right. With that, I will stop recording. I will close the session. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, have a good rest uh, of your day. Okay.